Shelby and I have in common is we have the same guy who makes our clothes. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, you'll see just in a second that we're color coordinated today, which makes King really happy. <laughs> so um, spending an hour and a half over lunch with Don Shelby is quite an experience. I felt like I should have bought a ticket. <laughs> we had so much fun. We talked about family. We talked about health. We talked about gratitude. And it's interesting when you can sit across the table from someone that your only relationship with has been through the evening news. And what I found was a guy that I really enjoyed. Here's a guy with Hollywood looks and a caramel apple voice. And, you know, honestly, a spirit of gratitude that un who had an even more dramatic health episode at about the same age as I did. And there were people in the television sphere who were praying for his return after a stroke. And so he came back on fire. And if you read my blog this week, you'll know that he walked across the Serengeti, climbed a whole bunch of mountains, went to Iraq to visit the troops, and on and on and on. And so what he's here to talk to us today about is what, what is a guy who has everything that he has, what does he do when he gets up in the morning, and how is he trying to make the world a better place? So without further ado, please join me in welcoming my color-coordinated colleague, <laughs> Don Shelby. <laughs> so stand right up here. Look at this. Look at this outfit, huh? <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here, and I'm honored uh, to be considered to be among the stellar list of people who have spoken to your group. And uh, I'm humbled. Uh, I know a King would find that hard to believe, that <laughs> humbled in any respect. But um, it is true that, that I uh, buy my clothes from, from King. And the suit that I'm wearing today, uh, I added up driving over here costs more than my two-year salary as a non-commissioned officer of the United States Air Force. <laughs> Which means it could be a cheap suit. So, uh, <laughs> it's not an empty suit. That's not what you always said. I think you called me a, a suit and a haircut one time. Leadership is an awfully important uh, subject to me, and I hope that you will find as I uh, talk, and I, I have uh, about 20 minutes to do so, that, um, that you'll find all of the seven Fs in what I'm about to say. I could uh, start way back at the uh, beginning, uh, but I want to start with three compliments that were given me, because I find that um, you have a tendency to live up to the expectations of others. Um, if you don't have built into you as a young person a great sense of self, then you look for the admiration of other people and you find ways to do that. So um, you see me standing here today as a former television anchor and fundraiser now and 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 what I see when I look in the mirror is a person covered with post-it notes um, of all of the things that I admire in other people. If I see someone behave in a certain way, if I uh, uh, if I am led by someone with a great experience and adeptness, I, I make a note and I stick it on me. I want to be like that. I want to become the best that I see around me. And it's part of William James's philosophy in the early part of the century when he was writing as the father of psychology that uh, if we aren't generous, but we would like to be generous, but we find it difficult to be generous. Or if we're not courageous, but we want to be courageous, 
then his admonition to us is simply act as if you are that. Just act as if you are generous. And in time, you become generous. Act as if you are courageous, and you will be eventually courageous. And so what I've been trying to do my whole life is just live up to the expectation that I have for myself based on the behavior of others and the very best in human quality. And sometimes that's goodness. And here are the three compliments that I received in my life that have guided me. The first compliment came from my mother at a very early age. I was, and it wasn't really a compliment, uh, but I took it and absorbed it as a compliment. I was that 13-year-old boy who uh, was coming from childhood into uh, adolescence who was absolutely frightened about what the prospects were for me because I didn't want to grow up and I was afraid of growing up and getting away from my family and not knowing what the heck I would do with my life. And I said, Mom, what am I going to be when I grow up? And, and she said uh, the finest and sweetest thing uh, a mother can say. She said, honey, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you're as good and kind and generous as your daddy. Um, that has been a burden because there's no one as good and kind and generous as my father. Um, but I've tried to live up to that expectation because I think that's a good thing to be those qualities. And so I've wanted to be that. My brother was eight years older than me, and um, I played basketball. And I was playing in a conference game, and he flew in. Uh, he was in service. And he flew in a long distance to be at a conference final basketball game. And we uh, played in the game, and I wanted to play very uh, well for him uh, because he'd flown so far to see it. And, and, and really, I didn't understand why he would do that because as the eight-year-old big brother, his job in life was to beat me up so, uh, <laughs> and humiliate me at every uh, chance he got. Uh, but he did, in, in this uh, maturity that he had gained in the service, coming back and wanted to see me play. I scored only two points in that game, and I was humiliated. I played on a basketball team that had four Division I uh, players who would later graduate and play college basketball, and I, I was a walk-on. Um, and so he picked me up after the game, and we drove back to the house, and he didn't say anything. Uh, it was a 1950 Dodge, my mom's car, and he uh, uh, finally I said, well, and he said, well, you're not very good. <laughs> And I said, well, I, you, you, you flew 4,000 miles to tell me that? And he said, yeah. He said, those other boys on the team, they're better than you are. And I said, I know that. They're, they all got Division I scholarships, and so I, I know they are better than me. And he said, yeah, you're not, you're not as good as they are. And uh, so we got home, and I got ready to get out of the car, and he grabbed my arm, and he said, I'm not done. He said, uh, you're not as good as they are, but they're not as good as they are if you're not on the floor with them. They're better when you're on the floor with them. When you're out of the game, they're just average basketball players. But when you're on the floor with them, they're better. And I thought, well, maybe that is my job in life. Maybe that is what I'm good at. Maybe I can help other people be better. Maybe I can affect other people around me by encouraging their work and by giving them opportunities and rewarding their excellence and letting them know that they're a part of my life and that they are part of my success. So here I stand today, and, and, and Paul's introduction was wonderful, but I'm, uh, I'm a product of all of the people who have ever, ever uh, taught me and supported me and modeled wonderful behavior that I wanted to replicate that I wanted to be like. And it's okay for us as adults to keep looking all the time at great behaviors.
at great behaviors and say, I want to be like that when I grow up. Even if we're 50 or 60 years old, we can still say, I want to be like that when I grow up. The other compliment came uh, during the war, and, and these are all left-handed compliments in, in essence. Uh, commander came up to me and said, you're not very brave. <laughs> and I said, I think I know that. And he said, but you're courageous. I went, well, I thought they were the same thing. He said, no, son, they're not. He said, uh, bravery is the uh, act of a fearless individual uh, to take action in the face of that danger. And you will never do that because you're not fearless. Um, he said, but you are courageous because you're scared all the time but you will still take that action. You act in the face of fear. And I uh, stuck that on me as a post-it note, that that's maybe who I am. That, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid to be on television. I'm afraid to sit in front of a million people uh, every night and, and know I'm being judged. But I do it anyway because what I'm trying to impart when I'm sitting there uh, is to give you the information that you need to become an informed party in the democracy. My dad used to read the newspaper. We, back in the day, uh, maybe some of you here uh, we're reading newspapers at a period of time that I'm about to tell you about, my, but I watched my father do this. This is when there were, even in my small community, there were two newspapers. There was a morning newspaper and an afternoon newspaper. And my dad would get up early in the morning, and before he'd go to work, he would read the, the newspaper, the morning newspaper, cover to cover, cover to cover, every word of it, all the jump pages, even the stories he didn't care about. And then you didn't bother him for an hour after he got home after work because he read the evening newspaper cover to cover. Never understood that because my dad taught Egyptology uh, part time and he was a galvanizer full time. And, and I said, why do you do that? And he said, that's my job. And I said, no, it's not. Your, your job is you're a businessman. And he said, no, my job is citizen. And I have got to know what's going on if I'm going to help run this country. And we've all forgotten that. Not all of us, but many of us have forgotten that. That the object of a Republican form of government, uh, a constitutional democracy, is to have individuals who have an informed opinion so that they can go to the polls and help run the country. That all of the people who uh, we hold in high esteem in public office, in elective office, um, are really our employees. And they do what we say if we're informed. And so it has, uh, it's always been a, a, a frightening thing for me to sometimes tell people unpopular stuff that people would associate with me where the messenger is slain for the providing of the bad news. And sometimes you just have to read the tough lines because you know the tough lines are the ones that are going to be the most uh, effective, the ones that are going to help the country become the best. Uh, I want to talk about faith, and I want to talk about it as it relates to uh, my great uh, uh, mentor, my father. Uh, and I have a very similar faith belief that he had. I asked him one day, and, and, and as we think of our fathers, the smartest man in the world, and I said, is there a God, is there? He said, I haven't got the slightest idea. He said, I have the slightest idea. And I said, well, you go to church every Sunday. 
do you believe in God? He said, yeah. I said, that doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense to me. You don't know if there is one, but you believe in one. Why? He said, because I want it to be true. I prefer a world. I prefer a world in which there is a caring goodness. And I'm the one making that decision of whether to believe or not to believe. And I choose to believe in that. That's the alternative. I have no wish to be a part of it. And I'm going to act as if there is a caring God in my life. And I am going to behave as though there is a caring God in my life. And so that's uh, how I operate. I don't proselytize to neophytes. I don't uh, tell people how they should believe. Um, which has given me an understanding of how one goes about working with communities and groups because Everyone comes to the table with a different set of beliefs. And uh, that's allowable. It's not the divisiveness that we face today uh, in our communities, which I would like to find some way to heal, that if you are the other, if you are not like me, if you have a philosophy or a religious belief or a custom or a color or a gender or an ethnology different than me, other from me, I distrust you. You're not like me. You're different from me. We disagree. Therefore, I don't like you. Walter Mondale told me one day that uh, you cannot negotiate ever with a person across the table who you believe is evil. We can't start in that position. We can't start believing that anyone who has an opinion different from us is evil incarnate. Family. Lessons are learned in unusual ways. I have three daughters, 36, 35, 34. But when they were seven, eight, and nine, they hated each other and uh, argued constantly. I don't know where they got their mouthiness. I think they got it from their mother. But <laughs> because they were very close in age, they had to be right all the time. And I said the only smart thing I ever said in my life. I mean. Barbara and I had been trying to get the girls to stop quarreling, and, and one day I just went upstairs, and they were just at the top of their voice yelling at each other, trying to be right. And uh, I said, you ha have to stop this now. Uh, you have to stop this because it doesn't matter who's right. It matters what's right. It doesn't matter who's right but it matters what's right. And your job, instead of arguing, is to try to discuss among the three of you what is right. Don't try to win the argument. Just try to figure out what the right thing is. And maybe, Ashley, you have a piece that Delta needs, and maybe Lacey has a piece that both of you need, and together we can build an informed opinion by having divergent thought. I've learned a lot from my family, from my family of origin and from the family that, that I have now and cherish. Uh, I can talk to you about friendship, and I won't cover all the Fs, but you'll find them uh, as a, a full part of me. Uh, friendship and fun goes together. I tried to think of what friendship is. Friendship is, to me, is uh, someone who loves you enough to tell you the truth. Not somebody you pal around with, hang around with, and laugh and have a couple of drinks. That's not it. 
Somebody who has the courage to risk the friendship by telling you a truth you need to hear. A truth about yourself that you're unwilling to face in the mirror. That's the kind of friend uh, I take the risk of being from time to time. To those people only who take that risk with me. I wouldn't do that to casual acquaintances, associates. But if someone wishes friendship, then the cost of that friendship is truth. Nobody has more fun than I do. Because I have fun in everything I'm doing. I'm having fun right now. Uh, life's not much worth living unless you're having some fun. And you've got to find fun in everything you do. I want to give you, uh, I've got, I'm going to close out. Uh, I wrote this book, and I don't care if you buy it or anything. It doesn't matter. I, I think I get 16 cents or something like that. But, This book is a, the armature is basketball, but they're stories, um, they're just stories of, of being together and playing together and working together and relying on each other. And uh, you don't have to be a fan of any sport to understand the 10 lessons that I put in the back of this book that I, that I learned for those people who spent more time with uh, basketballs or baseballs than they did with books or people who spent more time watching their children uh, play sports, the inordinate amount of time that we're now required to spend with our children on all the traveling teams that they're on and, and the big emphasis on the sports. This takes it down a notch. Lesson one is we play on a team. No matter how great our physical and mental gifts, we cannot inbound the ball to ourselves. We cannot initiate even the simplest play without help. Needing someone is not a weakness. It is fundamental to the game and to life. Five players with dazzling individual skills who do not play as a team will usually lose. Average players who share, cooperate, and play to one another's strengths and who unselfishly work will discover the magic of a total that is greater than the sum of its parts. This is not basketball. This is life. I've just explained to you how you uh, find the best in clubs and community and church and family and government and country. It all applies. Lesson two, the best statistic is an assist. Not rebounds, not points scored, not home runs hit. It's the assist. Unselfishness is its own reward Anyone can shoot, lots of people can hit. Few have the strength of character to resist the urge to help themselves into the spotlight and instead focus it on someone else. Lesson three, losing is a part of winning. No one likes to lose and no one should be asked to, but there can be no wins unless somebody posts a loss. Losses tell us something about ourselves, primarily how we can improve. Avoiding responsibility for one's role in a loss is self-defeating. Blaming others destroys cooperation and lets us avoid the elemental truth that we all need improvement. So accept the responsibility and grow. Lesson four, games are won at practice. This is important. It sounds like I'm talking about sports, I'm not. Games are won at practice. Anyone who holds back his or her best until the pressure is on will lose. Consistency derives from practice. Consistency derives from practice. Confidence from preparation. Instinct from repetition. In order to be at your best under pressure, you must have prepared at game speed. Lesson five, control the tempo. Knowing when to step up the pressure and when to slow it down is essential in both basketball and life. It's almost always a mistake to increase the tempo of your game when forced into it by the opposition. So answer pressure with calm. Answer panic with level-headedness. Don't be forced to play someone else's game. 
play your own with confidence. Lesson six, the best advice. The best advice sometimes sounds like criticism. No one likes to be singled out for criticism, especially in a crowd. Our reaction is often anger, denial, usually it's simply embarrassment, suffer it, address the fault. There's little growth until we figure out what we're doing is wrong. Sometimes we figure it out for ourselves. More often, someone else has to point it out for us. Either way, we can use that information to grow. Lesson seven, this is critical. Anticipate. Success rests upon your ability to think ahead. Calculating the array of options others may exercise makes you prepared for anything. A person who thinks one, even two moves or passes ahead will earn more opportunities than a person to whom everything comes as a surprise. Lesson eight, fellowship. Non-gender specific fellowship. I coach girls basketball, I call them fellas. We learn that there is more to the game than performance. We allow our hearts to fill with more than pride. We are drawn, drawn together by a common idea. We share the extremes of experience and we begin to play interdependent roles in one another's lives. Not everyone will understand and appreciate us, but we will understand and appreciate each other. Lesson nine, time out. There are times in life and in the game to stop. No points are given for continuing past the point of exhaustion or effectiveness. Timeouts are no admission of failure. Use them effectively to rest and analyze your next move. The smartest timeouts are those called just before it becomes obvious to everyone else that one is needed. Lesson 10, perhaps the most important, love. You can't simply like what you're doing and do it to its fullest. You cannot demand of yourself dedication unless you love the object of your dedication. And you cannot love something until you have come to respect and appreciate its detail and until you have sacrificed a part of yourself for it. Those are the 10 lessons of life that I live by. Um, and I don't know if they're helpful. I don't know uh, if they're useful in any meaningful way in terms of the kind of leadership that you represent in our community. Um, but if you absorb them and if you uh, find any one of those 10, uh, make a post-it note and stick it on your forehead. <laughs> You'll see it when you look in the mirror in the morning. No one else will see it. They'll just see the goodness that comes from you. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job. So the discussion question is, what's on that post-it note? I mean, what, what expectation do you have for yourself looking forward as a good leader? I have to admit, it's kind of fun to be up here imagining all of you with post-it notes on your forehead. Well, thank you. I have three questions for Don. And the first one is, um, how do you make time in your life for fitness? Well, I have uh, a set of uh, dumbbells in my study. And I'll turn on Nova, or I'll turn on the Learning Channel, or I'll put in a tape on calculus. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I have an arts degree and I'm and I work in the area of uh, science and I'm stupid uh, on science and so I've had to go back to college and study uh, for a BS degree and then I'm going to get my master's in science and then environmental journalism. So so everything today around climate change and around uh, energy efficiency is all uh, science and physics based. And so I have to learn all of those things. So I actually do have these DVDs uh, that I got from uh, something in the back of a magazine 
uh, on a flight somewhere. <laughs> We've all seen those. Somebody actually looks. buys those, huh? I don't, <laughs> oh, I've got stacks and stacks <laughs> of them because I... You realize, you realize uh, the longer you go, how stupid you are, yeah. and uh, all the things you. I'm going to write know, that down. So. You know, <laughs> I keep running into people that know so much more than I do, and then I want to know what they know, so I have to go get one of those tapes. And so wait a in. second. You use dumbbells when you're trying to. Right. So yeah. that, so I so I, it's uh, here's another rule that I have. I never do one thing unless I can do two. Um, <laughs> and as an example of that. Uh, I was giving a lot of speeches when the girls were growing up, and uh, sometimes those were weekends, taking me away from the family. Uh, so I'd go to uh, Mankato, and they'd say, well, we can't pay you. Uh, but I'd say, well, I'd say, but do you have anyone uh, in the Rotary Club that has the motel in town, and does it have a swimming pool? And then, so I'd take one of the girls, and we'd do a road trip, and so Dad and, and one of the girls would have the whole two days together to talk and they could stay and they would have a little babysitter and they could swim they'd have a wonderful time and then we'd have uh, this time to get to know each other so it was the one thing was going to give the speech but doing the two things at the same time uh, is just an example of always doing two things so you actually live twice as long yeah, there you go. <laughs> Because well, you're, you're doing the, two times as many things as yeah. most people do. In the so. book that Tim and I wrote about the seven Fs, we call that blending. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, we think it's a, an excellent strategy. But I also, I play basketball and I climb, uh, I'm a hiker, uh, a canoeist, um, I'm an Arctic survival teacher, uh, so I stay uh, fit through uh, a lot of physical stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, mental fitness uh, seems to follow on that. Yeah. The more fit you are physically, the more fit you are mentally, the quicker you are mentally. Yeah, excellent. So, um, excellent visual imagery about the uh, post-it notes. Uh, that, that's powerful. Um, so, what is your expectation of yourself looking forward? Well, I've spent uh, 50 years in saddle uh, trying to work through um, my medium uh, in providing the wherewithal for people to develop an informed opinion and because I owe such a debt of gratitude and and this is something I didn't mention Paul and I should have that uh, the overriding the overriding element of my uh, worldview is gratitude uh, I am grateful for every second that I have uh, I am grateful for all of the things that have uh, come to me. Uh, I never use the word luck. I never use the word good fortune. Uh, something uh, happens uh, uh, wonderful to me, and, uh, and and it may seem uh, sacrilegious, but I just I just salute God. I just thank you. Um, to I learned as a, as a kid to uh, uh, praise God in all things, and. Uh, and I'm grateful that uh, I've survived uh, some, some awfully hairy uh, circumstances, some very dangerous circumstances, uh, some very self-destructive behaviors, uh, and have been rewarded a thousandfold for every good thing that I've ever done. And I've seen it work, a practical thing. It is absolutely true. It, uh, you don't have to be a, a deep believer in the gospel. but. Uh, I, I am fact-based. I see that you do one thing, you get a thousand good things. Mm -hmm. It just it, that is how the math works. I have seen that happen. Um, and and so gratitude, I, I am continually grateful for for everything. Now, what was that question? Because I, <laughs> I will you tell us what you're doing for the Washburn Child Guidance Center? Okay, all right. So what you do? <laughs> So I thought retirement was going to involve a fishing pole and a hammock, um, and it's been the opposite. I'm working more hours uh, per week than I did when I was working for WCCO, uh, and I'm not getting paid. Um, so, and, and now my wife has developed a, a language that every time I walk out of the house to uh, do a talk or uh, go to a board meeting, she goes, is this a paying gig? <laughs> um, and I always have to tell her no. And then she always reminds me, we still have bills to pay. Um, but one of the things that I have uh, been associated with, because I had 
uh, our first child, uh, Ashley, uh, apple of our eye, uh, as all the first children are, and just a wonder, uh, this miracle. Uh, by the time she was six, it, uh, we, we began to realize that there, you couldn't make her happy. There was nothing you could do to make her happy. Um, she was, um, something was wrong. And I blamed Barbara, and Barbara blamed me, and uh, it was, uh, it was a, a terrible uh, time. Until someone mentioned, uh, ha well, why don't you have her seen by the Washburn Center for Children? And I'd never heard of it. It was, uh, it was just nothing on my radar. And, and I was embarrassed. Uh, the stigma attaches to that. I mean, you know, something's wrong with my kid. So we take her in, and in a year and a half, they fix it. They find out exactly what it is, and they fix it. And then she ends up getting her master's degree from Columbia, and she's a writer and an author and a parent and a tax-paying citizen, and she's never been to jail. And, uh, and uh, so when Washburn asked me to be the head of their capital campaign for this $25 million new uh, facility, which will be the Mayo Clinic of Children's Mental Health um, down on Glenwood and Van White uh, Boulevard, uh, they said, uh, you need to raise $25 million. And now you're t looking at the person who's never raised a dime. Now, I've been a uh, host, MC's tuxedo guy in front of galas where you ask people uh, on behalf of someone to raise money. But I've never gone in and opened up the door and said, Vance Opperman, can you give me a million dollars? I never did that before. Because if you did that as a journalist, uh, if I'd asked Tom Petters for a million dollars, um, and he gave it to me, then, then Doug Kelly would be clawing it back right now and I would have sped it. Um, but CJ would be writing about the fact that Tom, Don Shelby can't report fairly on Tom Petters because he's got a million dollars in his pocket from Tom. So, so we, we as journalists were never allowed to raise money. Uh, and so uh, in two and a half years, and Amy Langer will be able to talk more about this uh, at the beginning because she's on my steering <coughs> committee. But uh, I'm, I'm $1.8 million away from the $25 million goal, and I'm about ready to start it. Hey, that's I want to thank Cargill. Cargill was right there uh, at the very beginning uh, with a substantial uh, donation. And if, if any of your corporations believe uh, in what I know is the truth, and I'm about to give you the facts, and I don't want to waste any more of your time, but, it, but this, this is not a waste of time. One in five children entering kindergarten, now listen closely, one in five children entering kindergarten today in our state uh, suffer from a diagnosable mental condition. One in five. Only 20% of them get any help. That leaves 80%. 50% of that, 80% will not graduate from high school. And 50% of those kids will end up in prison within five years. Now, uh, Art Rolnick did a, uh, at the Fed, did a test for us, and he figured that $1 spent on helping these children overcome these uh, problems is $170 tax savings down the road to us. $1 to $170 return. Um, and that's money. I'm talking about happiness and childhood. That you can return the, the happy childhoods to children seems to me to be one of the, the greatest things you can dedicate yourself to uh, in life. And you all can be a part of it. And, and if you draw my card out of this thing, that's where my money will uh, go. And I would encourage you all to uh, support uh, the Washburn Center for Children in, in this regard because it will be uh, the, the internationally the foremost center in the world for the uh, treatment of children with, uh, with these issues, social behavioral mental disorders. That's outstanding and a marvelous segue Thank to you. our favorite part of the breakfast. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.